the sake of time, move on with just asking each one of you a couple of questions which will clarify your role in the Alliance and what it means in terms of the, the, the good summit that we are having here. Uh, let me start with Mr. Anil Sinha. Uh, Sinha Sab, you represent the World Bank in the Millennium Alliance and it's a multi-partner, multi multi-contributor alliance. But tell me in terms of the World Bank, how do you see, you know, bringing best practices to help the Indian social, you know, innovation ecosystem? Sure, no, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and, and, and for this question. The World Bank group, if I can just say two words, has a membership of 182 countries. I, as you know, I was in the IFC, we have 62 offices. Our main objective is poverty alleviation and creating shared prosperity. And we do that through money and advice. We can work with the governments on the one side, the World Bank, and with the private sector directly. Um, so it's a unique combination. And because of our reach, what we'd like to do is to share best practices, first capture them in different countries and share them across the countries so that we can have tailor-made solutions but based on better practices. So really replicating social enterprises, capturing these models is very much one of the mainstays that we try to offer in, in such a collective action platform. Uh, you know, for those of you who may not know about Millennium, sorry, those of you who may not be aware of the Millennium Alliance, a lot of people do know, Millennium Alliance is a multi-partner, multi-contributor alliance. It has, led by FICI and the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, it has uh, USAID, besides World Bank, uh, DFID, which uh, for reasons of elections in the UK cannot participate publicly in speaking on this session, not that they didn't want to be a part of it. Um, and then it has, uh, the, of course, private industry and uh, foundations. You know, very importantly, the foundation, the WISH Foundation, ICC, IC, ICI Foundation, uh, ECO. Uh, how do you see, on a global scale, what we are doing in India can be of use and, and be replicated? Sure. India is the hub of innovation. So in addition to what Millennium Alliance is doing, the World Bank has been running this development market competition, which is also to unearth, crowdsource these innovations. And we've agreed that we work together because you can only make a dent in this space if you combine. So one message is, let's combine all our forces. Secondly, capture these good practices. So with the Wish Foundation, we've just done this landscape of health innovations. Um, we can document this. My colleagues are doing an international database on a social enterprise innovations globally. So how do we capture this lessons in, in India, transfer them to South South, what we call it, within South Asia and intra African how to do it systematically? Because this could be what we call a corridor of prosperity. We've just done a, a systematic approach to replicate these business models across borders. To that, you need to look at what you need to do enterprise level and what you need to do externally. It's not that everybody is ready to replicate, not everybody is ready to scale. If you hark back to the old days when we talked about MSME, there was expectation then that micro will become small, will become medium, will become large, it doesn't happen automatically. How do you do it systematically for social enterprises which also have a social motive is more complicated than do it only for a business. So we made a replication framework on how to do this systematically. And this is what we would like to share and partner with others and use through our relationships in other countries. And you said, you know, rightly, we've got these offices in other countries. We are working with the Sark Development Fund and Mr. Karma is here, for example, who are going to run these competitions in all the South Asian countries. So how can we get the two entrepreneurs from both systems to work together? And in terms of the ecosystem in India, we have to look at what is an ecosystem. Let's unbundle this word ecosystem. And perhaps I can use the monitor inclusive markets framework. Ecosystem, they divide into four areas. Firm level, the value chain, the public good, and the policy level. We need to find out what is the ecosystem drawbacks in each of these four segments and then get other stakeholders to address them. So if it's policy and regulatory issues, then I think the government is, obviously you have to go to if it's a firm level, we need to look at it internally, what the firm level needs to do. And many of the issues I'm finding are not external, are actually firm level. Mm -hmm. Because a social entrepreneur, 
God bless his soul, enters mainly for a social good, but to run a large-scale enterprise, there's a certain business acumen. And then we're developing e-learning programs internationally now and offering them to these entrepreneurs so they can develop the skills to run a good business. Biggest issue, second biggest issue we're finding is the HR platform. You need a second layer of management skills to be able to expand into other countries or go to scale. Otherwise, the business will fail. It's difficult to attract the second layer because you can't offer big money to attract good quality managers. Many of them come for a short time and move on. Retention of quality staff is really critical for social enterprises and linking this to the skills area would be another area I would say that we should now look at. Externally, I think financial issues are strong, especially the early startup stage. And if you want to develop the ecosystem, we need more early stage risk capital and assistance, not only equity, but, but debt combined. And I think there's still a gap uh, that, that, that that's, that's being offered uh, there. And then when it comes to public goods, a social enterprise, say, we worked with Fino, which is now going to scale 70 million customers. But how can you get a financial inclusion program if you don't have financial literacy? Is it the job of a social enterprise to teach financial literacy to the public? No, it's not. So how do you get the public good going for a private benefit? And therefore, should we look at CSR for that? And if you look at the same thing in agribusiness practices, same thing in healthcare, sanitation, you can't fix sanitation problem in India by just more toilets. You need behavior change. Is it the job of a toilet manufacturer to look at behavior change? Surely not. So that's the public good part. And lastly, of course, the policy and the regulations part. We, and so I think that was where I thought that yeah. we could all come in as a, as a group. No, but the, you know, the, you, you, you very nicely unbundled the, the ecosystem. And thank you for doing that for a lot of us. But uh, tell me, I mean, beyond what you named in the four parts, is there anything else that you would call as an impediment that, uh, that, that a social entrepreneur faces, particularly in India? I mean, those four were big challenges. Sure. Right? So on, on the policy regulatory side, I think firstly, I, I, I think on the financial part and on the, on the company level, I think I've described that and I've yeah, described yeah, the public yeah. good part. And you need to look at the entire value chain, public and private together. On the policy side, entrepreneurship, I think India's biggest strength. But in the US, an entrepreneur is successful usually on the third attempt. How do we deal with failure? And if you don't deal with failure, you can't talk about innovation. They are the other sides of the coin. So I think we should look at how we deal with failure. And would somebody lend to somebody who's failed once? In the US, a venture capitalist would not lend to somebody first time. They would be wary. Second time, third time they attempted, they would give them actually a preference. In India, it's the reverse. So I would like to say this is another element, in my opinion, to developing the ecosystem, in addition to policy and public uh, goods and standard setting. We're looking at healthcare. Everyone's developing different novel uh, devices. Should there not be a standard in equipment size? Should there not be a standard in how you use paramedics? If you look at Advent Eye Care, it reduces the cost of service by using nurses to the maximum extent, and using the surgeons, and they do two and a half times as many surgeries as any other uh, surgeon in a, in, in a hospital. So the whole efficiency of the production line is, is, is reduced, but not every state allows for using paramedics in this supply chain. So mm -hmm. you can look at simple issues and, and tweak them along the way, and then, you know, we've done a report with the WISH Foundation on healthcare. Should we not look at the ecosystem per sector? I think it's a T, there'll be something that's generic, but then each sector has to have a separate ecosystem diagnostic um, with the industry uh, and with the government. And we can't do this without the government. So I'm really happy that you know, the government is here now. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, uh, let's move on to Mr. Radha Krishnan. He's Director, Directorate of Industry Interface, uh, DRDO, Ministry of Defense, Government of, government of India. Uh, we were just talking about policy and government. Um, what has been your sort of uh, uh, perception and, 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 and what has been your experience as a, you know, you draw from public funds, you use that for research and development, you come up with breakthrough technologies. How, how does it work in this alliance to be able to create entrepreneurs using the public research funds? Uh, thank you for first, first, uh, giving me the opportunity to share my views on this um, important platform. 
Um, as we from DRDO, dealing with the defense, innovation itself was, uh, we had to innovate internal to the system to come out of this shell, <laughs> what the defense is doing it. It's not easy for us to come into open space. Because to be innovate, innovative, you have to be speaking to many people. You can't be speaking to a, a captive customer. So that was the biggest challenge what we faced internal to the system. We had to come out with the mechanism by which we can start interacting globally beyond defense. We had a good partner with FIKI, so we could evolve a mechanism by which we can do that innovative, we can create an innovative ecosystem within the DRDO. So what uh, I personally feel, especially for all the federally funded organizations like DRDO, a lot of research goes on, especially in India, the maximum research takes place in government funded organizations. I think industrial research is minimal now. But government is spending huge amount of money. And uh, especially for DRDO, like the minister was telling that one, this is the only department which wants to spend a lot of uh, money on research and innovation, which, but doesn't want to use any of the product, unless otherwise he's compelled to. Because we develop a lot of weapons and uh, things, but we, never want, we don't want to use them. It's like an insurance which you wanted to take. You don't want to take insurance to die. If something happens, okay, you've got something, protection is there. Similarly, the country spends amount of money on d during uh, mm -hmm. defense development. But when we did an internal analysis of this technology, we found that one number of technologies, what we do for defense are necessary, or not necessarily defense, or not uh, offensive thing. It could be our dual use. It has got huge potential, and uh, it's, um, criminal ways to keep those innovations within the cupboards of DRDO. That's what we mm -hmm. really felt it. So we thought we should be able to pull out those things, put it in the market, let the market evaluate where they can put it. That one. That's uh, how that we start looking into innovation. If you ask me, any public funded research institution, they have to ensure that one, like, you know, they give back to the society. So this is uh, our way of giving back to the society. Number of technologies we have identified, we are pushing into the market. And uh, we also learned a lot of lessons. No, but among the lessons that you've learned, what, what is, what, can you share with us some experience on creating actually sustainable social entrepreneurs or organizations based on the technology that came out of DRD? See, the number of innovations what we are trying to push out, we, have got, no, we are giving special focus on social innovations, I think. Mm -hmm. Because there are industrial products which you can say to me that the business market is a business plan, is the industry invest onto that one. Especially for the social innovation, if you take the case of biodigester, that's an important uh, innovation which you have done to solve the problem of uh, fecal degradation in high altitude in Siachen Glacier. Mm -hmm. That's how that uh, DRDO be, uh, got into sanitation. Every time people ask, uh, ask me what DRDO has to do with the sanitation, so we do missiles, aircrafts, but how we got into sanitation when we have a full fledged ministry looking at sanitation. The problem started in Siachen where the only ice, there's no land. It was initially a pristine land, absolutely no issue. Then people, the uh, troops started staying there. Then uh, they were using that, uh, the same place where the, it's all snow everywhere. Even their um, normal day-to-day -day activity were all happening around that small area. And it was started getting into the food chain. After over the years started getting into the food chain, people started falling sick. Imagine a situation where there was a soldier falling sick in a Siachen glacier or in a lake. Mm -hmm. He has to be lifted back. You need a helicopter. One, four people have to accompany uh, one sick soldier. So the five people are out off the ground. So the, the army started facing enormous amount of problem. And they were looking for solutions. But nobody wants to go to Siachen to solve the problem. Who wants to work on human uh, fecal matter degradation? Being a captive organization, they referred the matter to DRDO. So then we started looking into that. And the whole human waste has been, we looked into the science behind that, chemistry behind it, how does it degrade something. So then we sent a team to Antarctica to understand how, what kind of bacteria survive in those extreme cold temperatures. And all the journey started from there. So we started looking into the various mechanisms, anaerobic, aerobic processes of um, degradation. Then we converted it into a technology now. It took around eight to 10 years for us to perfect it into a technology. Today, the biodigester is uh, very much there. Railways have adopted. And uh, if you, anybody has been listening to news and then watching that uh, space, all the almost 20,000 railway coaches are fitted with the DRDO biodigester. 
In two years, railway ministry has told that all the railway coaches in India will be converted into biodigester thing. So you don't see the litters on the tracks. So that's a huge innovation. But many of the social technology, if you look at it, the government is a stakeholder. So it is technology is only one part of it. That's what we have realized it. It's only a very small part of it, but the huge amount of effort is required to push it into the market. You are, you are creating some disturbance in the ecosystem. We need to do beyond technology in intervention because that's, that's the problem currently we are facing. How do we bring the stakeholders into this? And it's all, these are all things which are totally different. We, we are not used to, DRDO is not used to this kind of a thing. That's why we have taken the help of FIKI. They are the people that are now connecting the various dots. How do we bring in more players, stakeholders into this one to make it a successful thing? One example which I like to say that one sanitation, if you say that one, that the data is available, UNICEF, mm -hmm. everybody has been, 60% of Indian household is without the toilets. The, so the huge problem is our individual household toilets. But the government is coming with a number of schemes, MPLAT scheme, all other schemes coming, but they are not allowed to use the money on individual household toilets. How many, if you don't allow the MPs, MLAs to spend money on building individual household toilets, how are you going to address this 60% population? The government has schemes. So we have to find a mechanism by which, because actually they are people representative, we should allow means by which they can directly connect with the people. They should allow to build the toilets in individual houses, but the, the scheme doesn't allow. You can build community toilets, but everybody wants to, don't want to go to walk around to a kilometer to do that. I was going to ask you that question. You know, yeah. uh, you know even in this most important uh, area highlighted by the Prime Minister almost every week, if not every day, you're talking about public health and sanitation. And we can't have public toilets for everybody in the country. So how does, how does the DRDO work together with FIKI, Mr. Saxena? you know, jumping on to you, as he mentioned, this relationship. You know, to translate that into really creating, and as Mr. Sinha unbundled the ecosystem, how do we unbundle this? <clears throat> and I'm sure you have unbundled it, you know, in, in many respects. This is one example. So can you, can, you, can you throw some more light on how do we create that sustainable social entrepreneur or enterprise? And how have you been able to do it? And where do you see it going global? What is, how does Make in India go global? Uh, I think uh, it's an opportunity and challenge to FIKI and we partner with DRDO for sanitation program and this is for social cause. Uh, we are building sustainable ecosystem in the country with the help of our industries. We have licensed uh, about 70 industries so far and uh, we are seeking cooperation from public funds, we are seeking cooperation from philanthropy, we are seeking cooperation from CSR, uh, we are seeking cooperation from uh, social entrepreneurs to create a sustainable businesses around that. Uh, still, the challenge, uh, we are not able to fine tune any business model, like I would confess today the model which is working in communities like uh, for uh, uh, the paid toilets and the community places. But when you're going to install toilet at the individual level, how you're going to sustain that businesses is the challenge which we are trying to address it. Uh, we have been called by some national leaders uh, and we are doing, uh, we have been asked to do a two model village in the country uh, uh, on a biodiester toilet. And biodiester toilet for the audience is, is they have a technology where bacteria eats the all fe fecal bacteria. So there is no need of any sewage system. More than 99% of the fecal matter is being eaten by the bacteria itself. So it's a green technology, uh, technology which provides more hygiene around sanitation. And we have to build this as a role model in Indian villages. Uh, and we are attempting right now to fine tune the process. Now, uh, seeing India, we have six lakh, more than six lakh village as a huge business opportunity for social entrepreneurs sitting here. And uh, uh, Prime Minister vision is to make uh, defecation free on certain bandwidth of year. A uh, lot of corporates have been asked to co fund this initiative. A lot of uh, philanthropic institutions, religious institutions are coming. So with that mandate, we are also now evolving a business model where we're thinking of setting up a fund uh, through a public-private mode 
And these funds can be sought by social entrepreneurs in building their business segment in their respective districts or respective states in India. But uh, if we able to meet this challenge, I think uh, FIKI along with DRDO and Millennium Alliance will be doing a great job in setting a protocol for not only for India, but for other developing nations or underdeveloped nations to adapt. Uh, you know, you, you've been at it, Nirankar, for more than 10 years, just sifting through innovation, technology, highlighting what works for India, and, and, and you also created this Millennium Alliance. Tell us a little bit more about how does the Millennium Alliance inure to the benefit of social entrepreneurs in India? And, and how will you use this alliance and how are you actually using it? I think there are examples already of how the Make in India is going global. Uh, first of all, you know, we started this project in 2011 and happy to inform you the mandate of the project is in line with what Prime Minister is saying today. Uh, we started this in 2011 with how we can create sustainable business around sanitation, around health, around education, around clean energy, water. around water, around g good cities. So that is a mandate of Millennium Alliance. And we're thankful to all partners, and especially uh, the, uh, partners from four different countries are participating through their respective government aids. USA, DFED, ECO, Government of India, TDB. Now World Bank, we are talking seriously, we are Thankful to Energy for bringing Wellbank on the board. Uh, we're thankful to uh, ICIC Bank. Uh, we're thankful to Wish Foundation. Now, the structure is that now all these resources we have pulled in is as a small fund. Now, we have to scale this fund to a larger fund in a form of uh, debt, in form of equity, in form of grant. And uh, uh, we have a business tie-up with third, more than 35 social funds in the world to invest in our companies. Uh, we have invested in 29 companies so far. Our six companies or nine companies has gone global, doing helping the same technologies in other developing nations in Africa or in SARC region. Uh, so our main aim is twofold. That can minimalize, can, can be a development platform for defining, uh, I would say, a dramatical uh, innovation model to address the social need? And if yes, can we scale it in India? And then can we replicate this model in our partner countries <coughs> which are looking for a similar models? Uh, well put, and, and I would go back to what Ambassador Richard Verma said in the morning, you know, when he, when he reflected on uh, President Kennedy saying that we need to work together for the larger social good of the world, and then President Obama and, and Prime Minister Modi. Uh, you know, we are glad that this alliance has come together. We have similar goals. We have to fight certain challenges in India, but fighting them in India could also help us alleviate those in the rest of the world. So that's, that's the sort of model we are following, and I'm glad that if World Bank comes along, I think this will get a further boost and a push to use World Bank good offices in different countries to do that. Uh, shifting focus and gear a little bit, coming to you, Ale. Um, uh, you, you know, ECO as, as a foundation, right? Yeah. ECO is a foundation, right? Yeah. ECO as a foundation has been working in India and now is part of this alliance. Um, how does a foreign funding agency, you know, work through this maze of, uh, you know, a picky alliance, picking technology partners. And then what are the parameters you use when you look at investment in a particular sector or in a particular company? Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me also here. Uh, just two words uh, about ECO before I go to your question. Uh, ECO is a global uh, social development organization uh, working in uh, 44 countries for last 50 years. And in India, ECO is about uh, 35 years old. And uh, I would not like to call ourselves more in international funding organization here because I think we have localized mm -hmm. and we have uh, you know, a local legal entity called Innovative Change Collaborative. Uh, now, of course, going back to your question of uh, you know what kind of criteria or what kind of uh, you know what we look at when we uh, make 
investment that we bring in from the Dutch government, which is primarily aid uh, for the last 25 years or 30 years. Uh, initially, when ECO started, we actually uh, made, uh, we partnered with uh, civil society organizations uh, primarily supporting uh, small but scalable livelihood, uh, uh, clean energy, food and nutrition security projects. And uh, we found that a lot of good models were set up, a lot of organizations who were primarily very small at that time, 20 years back, have been able to come up with a good scalable model on sustainable livelihood, clean energy, food and nutrition security. Uh, but over the years, ECO has also transform itself to more of a donor organization, to more of a co-implementer or impact investment organization, meaning that we are now also making uh, investment in terms of debt, equity, and uh, bank guarantee, et cetera. So when we actually, uh, you know, in, with initial experience, we found that when we were supporting civil society organizations, uh, while there was innovative projects, there was scalable model, but uh, replicability or scalability was not at high. But currently we are also working in partnership with uh, like Millennium Alliance or with the government. I think there is a huge potential to you know scale up. For example, we are currently working with Jharkhand government under uh, National Rural Livelihood Mission. And there is a potential for reaching out to about one million farmers through agriculture value chain. Mm. So a small investment uh, on human resources or technical support can actually boost uh, you know, scalability of agri value chain. Uh, apart from that, of course, we also look at, uh, you know, uh, the expectation is not just a one-way process, it's also a two-way process, the kind of partner that we choose. Uh, we also look at what kind of uh, expectation they have, whether it's exchange of ideas, technology, uh, knowledge, best practices. So though there also we give a lot of importance. And we found that it's not always the money that uh, most of our partner probably expect, but then they also expect uh, exchanges of uh, ideas, uh, technology, uh, skills, and of course, best practices. So we, we definitely also give a lot of uh, importance to those aspects as well. Thank you. you. Since you said you know you work in 44 countries, right? I've been in India for 35 years. What has been your experience of uh, taking innovation, social innovation, out of India to other countries? And what's the USP you find? Do you find any unique selling proposition of Indian, uh, you know, social innovation that you've been able to take out of India? Well, oh, definitely. I think, uh, you know, we uh, always like to bring, uh, you know, a global experience which can actually work here in India, uh, which can be contextualized, and uh, also taking what we call is a local uh, innovations uh, or local experience to the global level, uh, depending on what would work. So. India is a place where a lot of innovations have taken place, and uh, India is a place where innovation has been tested you know, in different markets, different geographies. Mm -hmm. So that is a USP. Uh, for example, if you look at health, if you look at education, if you look at any clean energy models, uh, India is so diverse, uh, and it has uh, you know, anything that is innovated being tried out in different uh, markets, different geographies, with different kind of uh, uh, base of the pyramid uh, you know, group of people. So that gives uh, edge uh, for these innovations to go abroad and uh, you know, kind of uh, provide, provide services or you know, kind of get a good market. Thank well, thank you. Uh, I'll move on to Sumitra. Uh, with the Wish Foundation, uh, you know, you work in a dedicated sector, which is health. And I was asked to ask you, and I like this question, so I am going to ask you, are you overwhelmed or underwhelmed? I'm not going to ask you who asked you to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know. Oh, uh, well, and before I get into the actual challenges that we come across, I think I would like to start with, uh, since morning we heard a few figures. Yeah. One minister said that there are about 2,200,000 innovations listed somewhere in some database. The next minister said there's some 20,000 plus innovations, you know, tucked away somewhere. We know that there are 100 innovators who are in, uh, attending the expo, and we can't fill up the 1,500 seats here. Now, probably we have no more than 300 here, and this is the biggest challenge, and that makes me overwhelmed more than anything that I face, handling healthcare or anything. This is probably a forum which should bring everybody together, and as Vineet put it, like, you know, uh, 
you know, this is the seventh forum and this it's happening for the first time in Delhi. We still don't have that kind of a response from Delhi and government and that worries me again. Uh, last year when I visited uh, the forum, there were about 1,200, uh, if, if not more. And I was so, uh, so impressed by the forum and that's the first time I uh, attended that I came back and told everybody from both traditional healthcare sector where I belonged that my God, I never knew this kind of a forum existed. But I'm somewhat disappointed. I hope like, you know, uh, like, you know, a one day match sort of picks up after the lunch, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so hopefully the, the, the hall will fill up gradually. But we need an ecosystem. We need the different segments of the ecosystem, something which Anil talked about, and, and that need to be uh, catalyzed. Who is going to play that role? Can Fiki play that role? Government has not been playing that role effectively. Private sector cannot do that. Sankal can try, but it, it, is, it is the government's job. So would, would there be FICI or you know, such uh, you know, sort of bodies who can take interest and make this, you know, this forum spilled up? And that is, the, I think, the first thing that I would like to make uh, a, a request to. The second thing, there are, there are different kinds of challenges we come across. So I, I, it's a mix of both, overwhelming and underwhelming, both, I think, I go through. I think the first thing is that in the health, we are focusing in probably one of the most difficult areas, which is the primary health care. The moment you talk about primary healthcare, the you know everything and everything is under the under uh, what comes under the primary healthcare. We are talking about a system which is completely dominated by government, and so therefore, uh, when you're bringing in innovations, uh, which are largely coming from the private sector, uh, but then they have to work with the government. You can't create a parallel system there in the rural. Uh, India or even in the urban slum. So what happens is how do you make this public-private partnership work uh, when you know there is not too many uh, successful stories? And particularly in the health area where government feels that it is their, uh, it is their duty, it is a constitutional right, you know, education and health are the two constitutional rights the government must be providing to the, to the uh, people of this country. And private can only come in in the form of a cont contractual, you know, sort of a supplier and not a partner. So what happens as a result is that, you know, making good things work within the government system becomes that much more difficult, although it's a ready number which is awaiting the private sector. A social enterprise who builds a glucometer or whatever kind of device which is low cost, and if they can get access to the government volumes, they break even, break even much faster. They scale up much faster, and that is the, that is how we can actually go up uh, the ladder. And tomorrow, I mean, you can take it to different parts of the world. However, if there are those challenges which are uh, which are not overcome by these social enterprises, it is it is one of the first challenges that we face. The second is we are talking about, you know, accelerated scale up. Like you know, there are 10, 20 scaled up in uh, enterprises. How do we? take it to the hundreds and two hundreds in the, in, the, in the area of healthcare. And this is where, again, I come back to that ecosystem. The incubators have to be there. There are strong ideas, great ideas. But those ideators are not necessarily, uh, you know, the businessmen. They're not the business savvy kind of mind frames. So it is, it, is a, it is a hard task for us to sort of make those ideas successful unless we have some intermediaries who can take those ideas, take those uh, ideators, and put them through some process so that they come up to be a business model which is scalable. My last thing is like, you know, it's, it's an extension of what I'm saying is that uh, there is this difference between innovation and innovator. Yeah, it's a hotbed of innovations, India. But when it actually comes to the innovator, and managing the innovator, it becomes a huge challenge. And many of the cases that we deal with, we find that you know it is it is much harder. I mean, you you jump in with a great idea, but then when you start dealing with the individuals, it becomes very very difficult. And it's hard to tell somebody, hey, you're a great guy, but you're not a great business guy. So give this idea to somebody else and let him run this business. Uh, they, they don't they don't typically let you do that, do they? Absolutely. 
No, but let me let me ask you this. You you you've hit the nail on 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 a few important issues in the ecosystem. We started with Anil talking about the ecosystem and the unbundling of it, and then down to you where you've said that the ecosystem needs a lot of work, and the government, for example, considers it to be their constitutional right to 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 run education and healthcare. But at the same time, having seen what happened happened over the years in other parts of the world, I mean, yeah, we are a developing nation here, but. There's no, there's no stopping or precluding the private sector, which could get into the drug manufacturing business and turn it into a multi-billion-dollar industry for India and exports. That uh, you know, the primary healthcare or other rural, have semi-urban or sectors could also be tackled. I think we need a nudge and a push by people probably sitting here and then some, you know, in the audience beneath, uh, who need to sort of push this ecosystem along and and not always and only depend. Uh, on the government, which will stand up and defend itself for a variety of reasons and say, you know, we do the best we can and that's it, you know. Tomorrow there's election, we need to worry about ballot boxes first. So, w w what's your take on that? I mean, shouldn't the private sector the, the, the be taking a lot of lead on this? They're making a lot of money. Uh, see, I mean, uh, yeah, okay. I've been talking about, obviously I'm a supporter of the private s the sector. Uh, the government is also talking about private sector. I mean, you go and talk to them, they will say like, you know, we cannot handle this. Private sector has to come and take over this. The point is, for a public-private partnership to work, there has to be clear models that need to be, you know, worked out. So today when we talk about PPP in healthcare, it's basically the civil society organizations who are being brought into the public healthcare system and being asked to manage the PHCs and the subcenters. In my opinion, that is not a PPP. Mm -hmm. The reason being that, you know, the CSO or the civil society organization will always be dependent on the government funding. Now, in a PPP, if that has to happen effectively, there has to be a risk transfer mechanism and a plan worked out. So therefore, probably uh, it can start with a 50-50 kind of a partnership and then gradually it moves to a stage where private actually owns those PHCs, takes over the entire thing. But there could be provisions of buyback by the government if the services are not being provided by the private sector in a, in a, in a desirable manner. But those kind of mechanisms have come in a way in the highway or uh, even in the you know, airports and things like that, construction, etc., where there is money up front. You can see the money immediately. But in health, the money is not visible so easily. And so therefore, that kind of thinking hasn't really gone in, and it is not visible yet. And as a result, we don't see a proper PPP, unless you're talking about some tertiary level uh, interventions or some secondary health level interventions. But at a primary level, unless we change the primary health care system delivery, uh, we will never be able to make our health care system strong. And so that is where the government and the private has to come. And first of all, somebody, again I request, FIKI, Millennium Alliance, can take that lead to actually uh, pen down the, how this private-public partnership can take this. Balls back in your court, Nirankarji. Um, let me also uh, bring on board here our uh, Millennium Alliance awardees. Very, very delighted to have you here, Geeta ji. And Chandrasekhar ji and Abhishek, um, let me ask you, I mean, we are talking about the alliance, so just one maybe question to each one of you is, um, what did you get from the Millennium Alliance, this multi-partner, multi-contributor, you know, great alliance, and everybody here has spoken well about what the alliance brings to the table. But from your side, from your perspective, your take, what did you get? What's the value proposition? Um, thank you. Uh, I think it's been an awesome partnership that we've had with the Millennium Alliance. Because I think what happens with nonprofits, we get stuck into a little groove and we are not able to move out of that groove. We see, we see the picture very clearly in the work that we are doing. But when you have to take it beyond that groove, it becomes difficult for us. We are hedged in by you know, lack of finances, lack of uh, you know, people who can help us to carry the ideas forward. Planning, for instance, these are some of the, uh, I think, bottlenecks that we come upon. I think with the Millennium Alliance, 
what happened was, A, it gave us a lot of confidence. We said, yes, we are good at what we are doing. We've been recognized. And that gives you a lot of confidence to go ahead and do what you're doing. Because I think many of us in the nonprofit sector are so riddled by diffidence and by thinking, you know, can we do it? Are we the people to do it? Can we get somebody else to help us? So I think the Millennium Alliance uh, Award gave us that. I think it also gave us the confidence to go and work. Today, we are working with a lakh and 25,000 children. If we could have brought the children here and they could have spoken, they would have made a difference. They would have told us what is the difference that the Millennium Alliance is making in their lives. Because we are looking at children across 200 slums in Delhi. We are looking at 88 municipal corporation schools where work is happening. We are looking at libraries in these schools where children are accessing books. We put in more than a lack of books into these libraries to see that the books are being read. Because reading, as you know, if just imagine if India and Delhi could become the reading capital of the world. We have the opportunity. We definitely have the opportunity. Because reading is not just reading. Reading is where you go on from there into looking at social, cultural change that's happening. You're looking at environmental change that needs to happen. You're looking at health. Health is one thing which is given. But health, when it's realized, when children are saying, we can do this, when children become the change agents, then the change becomes more sustainable. And I think that is what we are looking at when we look at the Millennium Alliance partnership and how we can take it forward. And also, I think it's given us the ability to move on to a world global platform. Because we started working in India. It was, uh, I mean, I like the thing, make in India. So we were looking at, you know, what is it that India can bring to the platform? We looked at, you know, going from Delhi, going into Gujarat. We've gone into Himachal Pradesh. We are working in these places, in the rural areas. We've taken an urban model that was in the communities into rural areas to, to see how it will work over there. But beyond that now, it is the SAR countries. We are going global with our children's books, with our e-books. We are looking at ways in which we can have these children who are, we have the youngest population in the world. And we are looking at nearly 60% of them living in poverty. If you say that, then you have a lot of people knocking on the doors, saying, let me in, let me in. And they are willing, and they are ready to be let in. But who's going to open the door for them? Do we have enough people opening doors for our children? So this is where Qatar is working now. We are saying, can we work with CBSE? Can we work with ICSE? Can we get these children who are in more privileged schools can we get them to understand that the heterogeneity which is India, the diversity which is India, and the issues and challenges that India faces? The idea that I'm not alone, but I need to be here as part of a larger society. I need to contribute to that society. Can education make that happen? Can we be idealistic when we look at education? I think that is the challenge that we are facing as an MA awardee. Uh, that's very interesting, Lee, and I know your work, and I truly, truly laud and, and, and appreciate it. And I think it makes a huge difference in any country's future, and particularly, you know, a country like India, where you bring in education, which is the rock bottom line to creating awareness. And as we heard in the morning, you know, the perception fails, awareness fails if you don't have the very basic knowledge. And if you're doing that through Qatar, which I know you are, and I've seen your model school then and then god bless you you know and it's a great example to take to other countries we've also managed to get you know the governments working with us we have yeah. the corporation the municipal uh, corporations working with us at mm -hmm. the uh, local level we have the state government working with us we have the central government working with us this year we got the uh, ministry of external affairs working with us so we are looking at ways in which we can sort of galvanize action we can leverage the work that is being done in qatar in different ways, through reading, through education. So it is not just in one pocket, which is in Delhi, but it is spreading into other areas. And with a global uh, partnership that we have just signed with uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica, we are looking at this going into SARC countries. We are looking at the innovation of reading going into other countries which are needing it. And within India, we are looking at other states. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, what better could you do? Encyclopedia Britannica. Go. Good luck. Um, moving on to Abhishek um, on Eco India Financial Services. Tell me about what is 
what's the biggest challenge you faced in your domain sector specific and uh, and, sure. and and how did your experience with the millennium alliance or otherwise help you meet that challenge is that challenge still remaining or have you surmounted that challenge? <laughs> uh, so echo has been in this space for last seven years and uh, i think the biggest challenge initially was that of regulations and policy yes. and uh, and this, this I think now is the beginning where, where uh, apart from bundling of other ecosystems, the the payment ecosystem is unbundling truly in the country. Uh, having said so, there is uh, there is this new project called PMJDY, fantastic project, but there is still more government and less of governance. We would want it otherwise. We would want it to be less of government and more of governance. We would want that there are frameworks which allow for players who have been here for a while to go ahead and scale this. And 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 my take is that if this unbundling tr truly happens in the space which we operate in, hopefully we will see that scale and that effective scale, not just counting the number of accounts open, but truly seeing how digital money gets adopted uh, across the country. Uh, and, and cell phone uh, being a primary driver to that. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as our partnership with Millennium Alliance is concerned, I think uh, uh, in my sector, the money which we got from Millennium Alliance was really at the right time. And, and it is, it is uh, it's really ironical that we should have got a lot more private funding than Millennium Alliance funding, but nevertheless, it was very helpful. Uh, it did give us visibility, and as all entrepreneurs want more, we want more, and uh, we definitely will want to push uh, the participants of the alliance to help us scale this within India. Uh, the technology which we have is is absolutely unique globally. We would want them to help us take it to evangelize it with the government, help us take it uh, beyond the country. So that's definitely an expectation, and I'm sure that other entrepreneurs here will have. But it's really, uh, uh, it's really I, think, uh, I think the opportunity of financial inclusion is huge. Unfortunately, we haven't seen players uh, really scaling it up in a big way. Uh, and, and my take is that if, if stable frameworks are created, which allows for for uh, investment investors to feel confident about it to invest, and for the private players to go ahead and scale this big time is really needed now. Good, good. I know you're doing good work, um, Chandu Shekharji, Oris Health. Of course, I know you have seen your product, good work. But tell me, um, you were dealing with markets external to India, right, with your product. What has been your experience going global with Made in India? See, I think uh, two things. Uh, our relationship with Fiki started in 2011, uh, where we were actually uh, selected as the best innovation by the DST Lockheed Martin. Uh, so that is to develop a product. And uh, you know, making product in India, that high technology product, is uh, very difficult because you need uh, a lot of capital. And more importantly, you also need the space to demonstrate what you have done. So that uh, Fiki helped us quite a bit, uh, both in India and abroad. Then we went about raising capital from pure play venture capitalist. And uh, you know uh, that's how we built our product portfolio. But then uh, what is really required, what we understood in the last, so our focus was to play a role on eradicating preventable blindness. And we went to find out what is the reason for that. And then we fo figured out that there was a need of technology. and then made the technology. So technology was a consequence. Technology was not, we didn't say that we will go and make a device. We wanted to eradicate preventable blindness. We found that there was a gap. We went and filled that gap through technology. We also realized in this journey, so today we have more than 700, 800 installations, 20 countries. But what we also realized is uh, technology alone is not enough. What is really required is you have to do the hard work of actually also implementing it, whether it is done by government, whether it's done by private, that's a different question, but actually you have to, uh, as a device maker or as a social enterprise enterprise on this side, we also have to do the hard work of making it work. So you will 
actually meet uh, people who are in urban uh, rural urban or uh, or or in middle class or lower middle class or bottom of the pyramid each of them have different problems so implementation actually becomes almost 70% of the problem i would say innovation is only 30% so when you have to do this implementation then again you get into this problem of how how to work on multiple business models and or how to work make it work on countries where you don't have the knowledge of the uh, uh, of the country so that's where uh, millennium alliance is helping us in a big way so going to a completely new terrain like ethiopia and trying to see how can we implement the technology so what may work in india so we take a lot of things for granted right you know internet will work and things like that but you may find that internet may not work you may find that you will identify people with problem but there may not be enough surgeons to actually operate them so actually you are doing more bad than good by actually identifying and telling them they have a problem so how to in, in order to make this work end to end uh, i think this is a great opportunity and that's that's what we would like to you know thank uh, the millennium alliance for helping us to explore these things and we are very confident that we will be able to play a significant role in some of these uh, market segments I, I see that Anil wants to make an yeah. intervention. <coughs> I, I just wanted to explain that this framework for going from India to Africa, uh, we developed in partnership with Intelica. And it was really not just a consulting assignment, it was really a true partnership. It's a public good. We want to offer it to anybody who wants to use it to go from India to Africa. The next piece will be intra-South Asia. Because clearly that's where our knowledge should be first, most important, because the development challenges are same whether you go within South Asia or Africa. So credit to, to Nisha and team. And just a last thought, the Prime Minister is very keen to improve doing business for the corporate sector. Mm -hmm. Should we be thinking of doing business, and I'm just looking at Vineeth, a doing a business indicator for social enterprises? The World Bank Group, as you know, runs this DB report, doing business report. I don't want to go into that, but it looks at 10 indicators which are vital to do business. Should we be looking at some kind of a benchmark for social enterprises, and so that we can annually track how those key indicators are doing and track that against feedback from the social enterprises. No, I, I think it's a great idea, and, and of course, uh, you know, Vineet must move on all good ideas and great ideas with vigor and, and speed. Um, I, think, I think you have to take it in, the, in that direction. I agree with you, Anil, and um, coming, you know, fr from what I have heard here, everybody talk, I think, you know, we have begun to unbundle, we've begun to see the problems in the ecosystem. We've sort of identified where the immediate lacunae lie. For example, we want a better framework on, uh, on the public-private partnership, and I agree. Uh, the policy structure is very, very critical for government. We've heard the government itself talk about the challenges from within the government when they have something novel and innovative to put it out there for the larger social good of, uh, you know, the people. So I think, you know, this is one of those evolving India or a large evolving, uh, I mean, a, a, a major challenge for a large country that, that goes through development. And I think whatever India ends up doing and whatever Sankalp and, and, and Fiki end up doing in terms of deliberating and with the outcomes would, would become a great learning curve and, and a lesson for the next Sankalp and for the next country coming uh, coming along that curve. And I'm glad to be here. Um, we, we finished our interaction, at least for my part. I would uh, love to ask any one of you if you have any questions for these, for the lady and the gentleman here on the panel. If any one of you have questions, please feel free. Otherwise, we can close the session because in the interest of time. Anybody? So you all agree with all of them and oh please do you have a question you know that's okay it's working to reach them market is what has been projected by everybody. Thank you. That was a great comment. Thank you. Anybody else? And so I think we are done. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, who? Iti. Hi, I'm Samit. Uh, 
and uh, this question uh, is like open to the panel. Maybe Mr. Amit Sinha or uh, Mr. Nirankar Saxena might have some comments on that, sure. or anyone for that matter. Um, when the World Bank or any of these agencies look at uh, low and middle income countries like India and others, uh, they tend to uh, give a lot of funds for pilot projects. And my belief is, for example, India is really turning into a graveyard of pilot projects. We have a lot of them that get done, but then they don't get carried forward for various reasons. So is the government or is any organization really looking at uh, developing models which could uh, probably maybe just put a break on pilots and look at the impact and taking it forward in a much larger way? Great question. But I think I would I would sort of uh, put it into two. Uh, should should this be a government job of taking the pilot projects that have already been created and you said you know tens of thousands of pilots, or should it be a private sector job or another fund as we've talked about earlier in today? Uh, I think uh, very good question. This is a gap area in any developing nation. Piloting has to be done on uh, on such a selected innovative solution which has large dramatics impact. Uh, to our knowledge, uh, we run many programs with the government and we have uh, fund minimum lines also. But the selection process of those pilots has to be is very uh, no in consensus with the partner. It's not uh, that you come with the project and we take a decision, this is a good project. The selection process itself will take about seven to eight months. Uh, that will kill the spirit of the entrepreneur. Uh, we, uh, and I am sure we, uh, we work with government of India, no government schemes. There was used to be a scheme earlier uh, when Dr. A.S. Rao used to run the scheme in the Department of Science and Technology. They used to fund 15 lakh rupees uh, in just six weeks time. You come with a pro proposal, if they like the scheme, they'll give you 15 lakhs to do a pilot through a committee and then draw the impact. But this is a need. Today, we have to sit together and, and uh, address. Uh, we ourselves facing, we are bringing such a major solutions to the country like India, which can solve social problems, which can solve clean energy problems. I'll give you an example that we are in touch with government of US bringing a 10 megawatt battery pack in India, 10 megawatt battery pack, with no external fuel, no power, no s water, no s wind, no sun. It works on certain low thorium based electrodes. This is, a this is a pilot which can have a social impact. We are struggling itself, you know, as Fiki, to find a solution with our decision makers. I, I totally agree and uh, I, request for a comment with Anil uh, on this issue, you know. No, I, I, f I fully agree, and I must say that I must, must appreciate publicly, uh, Karji, how you reached out to us and brought us in here and in this collaboration. It, it's fantastic that, that the, the outreach and the collaborative effort you've shown. Um, really nothing to add except to say that perhaps as far as social enterprises is concerned, we need to segment. So where is it something that's just an idea stage? Where is it proof of concept, where is it now going to the growth stage and then if it's going to be replication stage and different interventions at different stages. And if a market has to function, we have to have the segmentation and different interventions at that stage. And some, to some extent, if somebody wants to do something on their own, they have a new idea, well, they should go ahead and do that. I fully agree about government programs and pilots. Sometimes when people come to me, I ask them, you know, if you're coming to me with another pilot project, and I tell them I think we have more pilots than Air India now, so let's be a bit careful now, <laughs> but that's a joke. Uh, but as far as the private sector is concerned, why stop innovation? But keep it segmented yeah. so that it doesn't become um, something that's evergreen. So uh, that's that sometimes, you know, pilots become evergreen. That's the problem. They never go to scale, and, and especially uh, uh, development-oriented projects have this big problem having worked in, in, in development in many parts of the world. But the private sector, I think, let market forces rule and let it be segmented in, in, in a certain manner. Uh, I think the public and the private both have a different aspect to pilot. Okay, just uh, please, add please, this please, one, please. because something is quite interesting. We talked about 
See, like uh, when there is a business case, private sector easily uh, invest into that one. How many of you know MTR Foods is technology out of DRDO? 600 crore company, 60% is a processed food. All that type of product coming on MTR is uh, technology given by DRDO. Many people do not know. You don't read the small letters. But when it comes to social technology, because that, that's a business case, easily they come to do that. When it comes to sanitation, it's a big challenge. Like Chandrasek was mentioning, technology is only one portion of it. Implementation is a bigger issue. So we have, our program is supposed to provide the technology, technology commercialization, not product commercialization, not a marketing agency. But we realized it, it is just not possible for us to just give the technology and then leave the market to decide. We took that extra step. We need to demonstrate the pilots. Then we have to define what is a pilot. So and if you are, now that's a tweet, uh, tweets are going on, <coughs> somebody should go into the Nirmala Sitaraman's tweet. We just inaugurated the pilot in a remote village in Andhra Pradesh. You just see a tweet and then what is the kind of response you got it. Individual houses, we demonstrated we had to mobilize resource thanks to FIKI. We did that. Now, we also want to see, show that technology can work in multi-story apartments. Our residential complex in Timarpur in New Delhi, one hundred and fifty flats in seven-story apartment, we put a biodigester. It's without working on sewage treatment or STPs. I have a parallel block which is working on STP for which my own department pays 50 lakhs per year annual maintenance contract. This one is working for the last three years without any STP. The direct saving is 50 lakhs per year. And the quality of water coming out of the biodigester is better than the STP water. So this is now we are using it for gardening. We are now flushing it to the drainage system so that in fact there we don't have because you need water to flush the drainage system. We are doing it. We have models, but we want this to be taken because now the new mini cities are coming up. This is that it has to catch and then somebody has to take it forward. Up to a point the government can do. As a government department, we can do. But we need agencies like World Bank or somebody who can see that one. It, now we say that one is definitely scalable. They have to bring in partners. They have to bring in resources, people, to take it up to the whole nation. Thank you. Uh, I just conclude by saying I think we all agree that there is an ecosystem. We have to unbundle it a little bit, work around with the parameters that, that have come, come, come out of unbundling the system and... Uh, and see how we can fix it, make public-private partnerships work. And as Mr. Radhakrishnan said, rightly, I agree with him, is that uh, you know not everything can be thrown at just the government or just the industry. It has to sort of be mixed and matched. And we need to actually help create sustainable social enterprises. And I think that's, that's sort of the message that has come out in the past and will continue to come out of these, uh, these summits. Thank you very much again for attending. And we hope you have a lovely two-day summit. Thank you. Thank you.